Praise God. God is good. So good to see everyone here today. I am going to turn in our Bibles to Psalm number 59. I am reading verses 9 through 11. And I believe they're on the screen if you want to follow along with me. Psalm 59, I'm beginning with verse number 9. The Bible says here, I will wait for you, O you his strength, for God is my defense. God is my defense. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire on my enemies. Isn't that encouraging? That we are going to see God's desire on our... How many of you have enemies? I'm not talking about people. You might have a few of them too. Our real enemy is not the person that looks at us from the other body. Our real enemy is a spiritual enemy. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but sometimes our real enemy is looking at us in the mirror. But we certainly all have a common enemy, Lucifer, who is the enemy of the souls of men. I will, God shall let me see my desire on my enemies. Now look at verse number 11. And I want to emphasize this first few words here. Talking about his enemies, he said, Do not slay them. Do not slay my enemies, lest my people forget. Now, don't you think it would be really convenient if God would just take our enemies, including our sinful nature, and just kill it? Just get rid of it? Just have our enemies be destroyed? But David said... Don't kill my enemies. Why? Because I might forget how much I need you. That's powerful. Don't slay them lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power. Bring them down, O Lord, our shield, but don't kill them. Keep them around because they remind me how much I need you. Go ahead and clap your hands. That's all right. And so for lack of a better title, I've just simply entitled this, Lest My People Forget. I don't ever want to forget how much I need Jesus. Can you say amen? Just before I get into my sermon today, though, I want to encourage you, if you are not already a uh, listener to Maranatha Live on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, it is, it is live on our Facebook page and also on our YouTube page. You can just search at Maranatha Ministries UPC on either venue. I did uh, a session this past week. Um, and I was starting to get into a lesson that I wanted to talk about. And then I got, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came on me and I started talking about some other things that I think is a blessing. I know it's a blessing to somebody. People have already come to me and told me what a blessing it was, but I think it is a blessing for more people. So if you are not a regular listener to Maranatha Live on Wednesday nights, I encourage you to get on and get the recording. It's online. It's on our YouTube page. It's on our, on our Facebook page. The recording. Stay up there and listen to this past Wednesday evening. First five minutes or so, I got to be honest with you, don't shut it off because people were texting me, giving me information while I was trying to get started and I was trying to answer text messages and people were putting comments up asking me questions about Sister Takara's life study. Oh no, it was Sister um, uh, uh, Sarah Warner's life study this past Wednesday night and I'm feeling, it took me about five minutes to get all that stuff out of the way and then I got into something and I want to encourage you if you didn't hear it to listen to it because I think it's going to speak to somebody. And if you're not a regular listener, I want to encourage you to jump on. on j jump on. And if you can't get there on Wednesday nights at 7, it's, they're always left online for your convenience later. And, uh, of course, let me put a plug in for our life studies also. Our sister Sarah has been teaching on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock. That's a Zoom meeting. You can get that information by emailing lifestudies at mmchurch.com. And Sister Takara has been teaching a three-part series on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. And you can find that information the same way, lifestudiesmarinathaministries.com. There's our plug for Life Studies. Life Studies is phenomenal. Past Brother Edwin has taught a lesson. Um, Brother Michael has taught some lessons. Sister Sarah Warner is teaching some lessons now. Sister Takara McCoy is teaching lessons. And uh, it's encouraging to hear these perspectives from other voices. Amen. Go ahead and clap. That's good. I want to start this message today by telling you 
that I am not as good as I will be one day. But I'm not as bad as I once was. Amen? I'm not where I'm going to be, but I'm certainly not where I was. I am a work in progress. How many of you feel that about yourselves? I am a work in progress. I want you to know today that God's purpose for you and for your life is bigger than any of the mistakes you've made or shall make. And God's purpose and will for your life is bigger than any of your sins that you currently make or will make in the future. And let me be the bearer of bad but honest news, my friend. You have not committed your last sin yet. I don't mean to be a prophet of doom. I'm just a realist. But you are better today than you once were, and you will be better in the future than you are now if you continue to serve and follow Jesus. God has not perfected in me everything because I don't do everything perfectly yet. I fall short in a lot of areas. I struggle in a lot of areas. I falter and I fall in a lot of areas. Can someone say amen and make me feel like I'm not the only one? I have made many mistakes in my life, and I continue to make mistakes. But I'm here to tell you today that God has not stopped guiding me just because I'm not perfect. And he also has not yet perfected me since I still do things wrong. I still do things wrong. I do not do everything perfectly. And yet, what do you do with the scriptures that say, be ye perfect for I am perfect? Well, wait a second. Am I perfect or am I not? And if I'm not, am I disobeying the Scriptures? Let me tell you something. I am not perfect because I do everything perfectly. And I am not perfect because I've always got a right attitude and always take the right action. I am perfect because every time I fail, I go back to Him and He washes me clean and I've got a fresh start again. That's what makes me perfect is my continual coming to the foot of the cross. Praise God. A while back now, in our life group, Brother Mark Weatherwax is a member of our life group. He's not here today. He, uh, he and his lovely wife have got a new grandbaby. Their first grandbaby lives down in New York City. And they go down there a lot to see. Can you imagine leaving to go down to see a grandbaby? Your only grandchild. Whatever. <laughs> But, uh, and Mark won't mind me saying this, even though he's not here, he won't mind me telling you this about him. We had our life group one night, this is, a, this is a year or so ago, so I don't remember exactly what the life group lesson was, all the life groups are teaching the same lesson, I don't remember what this one was, but it got us on the conversation of needing God and what God does for us and, and uh, what God has done for us, and Mark made a statement that I thought was possibly mo the most profound statement and way of putting it that I've ever heard. Because if you don't know Mark Weatherwax's past, Mark Weatherwax, and again, I'm not telling anything he would, he would not want me to say, uh, but since he's not here, I'll just say it anyway, without his approval. That's why you need to be in church, because you don't know what I say about you when you're not here. <laughs> but Mark uh, has, had a, has a past that include alcoholism, and also a gambling addiction. Uh, and that's all I know. I'm sure there's more. But those are two major areas that will destroy a life, alcoholism and gambling addiction. And we got to talking about what the Lord has done for us in this life group when Mark finally spoke up and he said, listen, Pastor, he said, here's the truth of the matter. He said, that's not who I was. A gambler and a alcoholic is not who I was. He said, that's who I am without Jesus. I said, wow. 
He said, if I ever walk away from Jesus, that's who I am. But with Jesus, this is who I am. <laughs> Praise God. Well, what about being a new creature? What about all things and all things have become new? All things have passed away. I am a new creature. I'm a new creature in the sense that I'm walking in a different direction, that I'm seeking a different goal, that I'm listening to a different master. That's why I'm a new creature, not because I do everything right, but because I am willing to allow God to correct my course whenever he needs to. Now, here's what's interesting, because David said, don't slay my enemies. Lest I forget about you. Listen to me for a minute. If I never had another problem, if I never had another struggle, if I never had another temptation, if I never had another failure, I would never seek him. Why do I seek him? Because I need him. Because I'm struggling, because I failed again, because I fell, because I had a wrong attitude, because I took a wrong action, and those things remind me constantly that I need a Savior. <laughs> Hallelujah. And if you ever slow, slew, slayed, I don't know what the word is, if you ever got rid of all my enemies... I might forget how desperately I need him. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 10. This is verse 38 and 39. Now the just shall live by faith. That's a scripture we quote all the time. But we don't finish it. His last part of it says, and I draw your attention to these two words, but if anyone draws back, you know people draw back from God after they've begun to serve Him? Some people draw back. If anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. If anyone draws back... Let me ask you a question. Why would anyone draw back from a God as great as this God is that we serve? Why would anybody draw back from him? Well, it certainly isn't because he's so awesome, is it? Nobody would ever draw back from him because of how great he is. And no one would ever draw back from him because he went to Calvary for my sins. That's no reason to draw back. No reason whatsoever. No one ever draws back from God because God is so great or because Jesus is so awesome. You want to know why people draw back? People draw back because they're discouraged with themselves. And they no longer feel like they deserve to be in God's presence. And they no longer feel like they deserve to sit among God's people. And so they begin to draw back from self-condemnation, not from God-condemnation. I'm telling you, you should not get discouraged with yourself. Because the day you think you're perfect, forget it. I'm just the type of preacher that will look any one of you in the eye and say, you are not perfect. Far from it, in fact. And I'm also going to be honest with you and tell you that I feel like the Apostle Paul, that of all, all men that are sinners, I feel like I'm the chiefest of them all. That's what Paul said about himself. That's the only disagreement I have with him. I think I am. I'm telling you, you should not be discouraged with yourself because every failure, every struggle, every defeat is just a reminder of how much you need Him. 
Use your struggles, use your failures, use your defeats, use your, use your sin to remind you that you need a Savior and run to Him instead of drawing away from Him because He welcomes you. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Steve Green wrote a beautiful song called People Need the Lord, and he said this. He said, every day they pass me by, and I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain. You know how many people in this world, you know how many people sitting here have private pain? that nobody else knows about? Living fear to fear. And listen to these words. Laughter hides their silent cries. They're laughing on the outside and being jovial, carefree, and inside they're hurting and broken, self-defeated and discouraged. And he said, only Jesus hears. People need the Lord at the end of broken dreams. He's the open door. My friend, you need a Savior like that. Someone said... There's a hole in my soul. You can see it in my face. If you look at some of the faces of the people in this world, you can see that there's a hole in their soul. And he said, you can see it in my face. And he said, and it's, it's a really big place. This hole in my soul is really big. But listen to what Jesus said. In John chapter 7, Jesus said on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If anyone is thirsty, anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Come to me and fill that hole that's in your soul. Come to me. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he concerning the Spirit who those believing on him would receive. The Spirit is the refreshing that we need. But the real problem is that we turn to and we look to the wrong things to try to fill this hole that's in our souls. And every one of us has it. Every single one of us. In this building, out of this building. In church, not in church. There is a hole in our souls that's longing to be filled, and that's why people run to so many things, trying to satisfy the hunger of their heart, looking here, looking there, trying to find the things that will satisfy, and I'm here to tell you that cars won't do it, wealth won't do it, success won't do it, drugs won't do it, love won't do it, family won't do it. There's only one thing that can fill the emptiness of a broken heart, and that is the Spirit of Jesus Christ, who breathed the breath of life into us to begin with. The hole that is inside every one of us is a God-shaped hole. It is a spiritual hunger and thirst for God that can only be filled by His Spirit. Now, you know what it's like to be physically thirsty, right? Right? My son and I, Jameson, when he was a young kid, and I was young and dumber than I am now, decided one day we were going to take a hike. I said, come on, James. He didn't know. He was just he's following his father. Come on, James. We're going to take a hike. And we hiked up a mountain that goes up a mountain, half a day's journey, around the back of the mountain, around a pond and waterfalls and back. It's a whole day trip. I got him in the car, drove out. We started up the, up the trail. 
on a nice hot summer day in New Hampshire, and I brought no water with me. No water. We were about a quarter of the way in, and we were so thirsty. That <laughs> James looked at me and said, Dad, you didn't bring water? You're the, you're the, you're the adult here. <clears throat> we saw a mountain stream trickling down through the mountains of New Hampshire, and we were so thirsty, we did what you should never do. You should never put your face in a mountain stream and drink the water. Because you don't know that an animal died a half a mile upstream and its rotting flesh is laying in the drink, coming down with all that back. You don't know. That's why they sell these drink straws now. You can stick in there and suck the water through the straw. I, I was young and dumb. And now I'm old and dumb. I'm telling you all that to tell you that we knew what it was like to be thirsty that day. And we so thirsty that we took the chance to stick our face in a mountain stream and drink. And we drank and God blessed my ignorance and took care of us. And neither one of us got sick. But you don't do stuff like that. I'm saying all that to say you got to know what it's like to really be thirsty and be willing to do something that you wouldn't normally do because you're so thirsty. And our spirits are like that. And the only thing that satisfies are springs of living water that flow from Calvary's hill. And we look to every other option to get a drink of water and nothing satisfies but Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is so good, isn't he? And so we can't allow ourselves to get discouraged because we still struggle with some things. You know, I talked to someone just the other day. It is not someone in our church, so don't start looking around and saying, I wonder who this fits. Nobody from my family doesn't even live in this area. Somebody I talked to on the phone. And they, we, we were talking, and uh, they mentioned that they had struggled with alcoholism and had not had a drink. I think, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think they told me 38 years had not had a drink. Go ahead and clap. That's okay. 38 years. And then he said to me almost, almost ashamedly, like he was ashamed of this. He said, I still go to AA. Like, I said, what's wrong going to AA? Some people think Jesus should do everything. I'm here to tell you there are some of these enemies need to stay alive just to remind you how much you need him. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with needing help from somebody else, whether it's AA or some other brother or sister in the church. There's nothing wrong with sharing your, your struggles with someone you can trust. There's nothing wrong with joining hands with somebody and say, how about we walk together? How about I strengthen you and you strengthen me? How about we understand that we are all on our way to hell without each other and without Jesus? How about we never forget how much we need a Savior? Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, but preacher, what about Jesus who said, be ye perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect? Let me tell you about being perfect, okay? I am not perfect because I do everything right. I am perfect because every time I do something wrong, I take it back to Calvary. That's what makes me perfect. When I fail, he washes me again, and I rise up perfect in his eyes one more time. And every time I fall, I take it back to Calvary. And it reminds me every day. I wake up every morning knowing how desperately I need him. I need a Savior. Don't kill my enemies, lest I forget how desperate I am for a Savior. Let me wrap this up. Are there habits in your life that you long to break free from? Are there thought patterns in your life that you need to change? Are there spiritual bondages in your spirit that you can't seem to get free from?
You know, if there was anybody, I preached about this guy a while back. I think I'm going to preach about him again from another angle. That's Samson. <clears throat> if there was anybody wild at heart, it was Samson. If there was anybody that did a lot of stupid things, <laughs> it was Samson. How stupid do you have to be for a woman to ask you, how many times? What's the secret to your strength? And then finally actually tell her? You didn't get it? The Philistines were there every time? You still didn't get it? How many times do you fall before you give up on yourself? How many times does your Delilah show up and you listen one more time again? And you can't believe you fell for it again. And I'll never fall for it again until the next time she shows up. Mm. Finally taken away by his enemies. Prisoner. Does one last thing before he dies, and guess what? Take a look in Hebrews chapter 11 someday and read verse 32 and see whose name is mentioned in God's hall of faith fame. Samson. Samson made it into Hebrews 11 hall of fame because he never forgot how much he needed a Savior. And at the end of the day, he said, Oh God, one more time, let me serve you. And I close with this. Is it not, is it not my failures and my faults and my struggles that remind me over and over again and make me realize how desperately I need Jesus? Is it not my failures and faults and struggles that bring me to that place over and over again? I need Thee. But, listen carefully now. Listen carefully. Is it not the devil's job to use those same faults and failures, to use those same struggles that are there to remind me of my need for Him, to make me feel like I have no hope. Why don't you throw in the towel and give it up? Well, God wants me to use my faults and failures as a reminder of how desperately I need a Savior to bring me back to my knees again. So I'll throw my hands in the air again and I'll cry out to God and say, help me to live for you. The devil is trying to say, what's the use? You're a loser and you can't do it. Give it up. Who are you going to listen to? How many times have you heard me say, and I promise I'm going to close him, but how many times have you heard me say and quote C.S. Lewis who said, inside every Christian is a non-Christian. A non-Christian who needs a Savior. My friend, when I wake up tomorrow morning, I will lift my hands in the air and say, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. I come to thee. Lord Jesus, don't ever let me get to the place where I think I'm good enough and I don't need any more help. Don't let me ever get to the place where I think I can make it on my own and I'll never falter again. And the next time I falter, let me use that as a reminder that 
I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Let's stand together and sing it.